We have two scripture readings this morning, both from the Gospel of Matthew. The first reading comes from Matthew chapter 17, uh, beginning at the first verse. <clears throat> Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them and his face shone like the sun and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Then Peter said to Jesus, look, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three dwellings here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them, and from the, the cloud a voice said, this is my son, my beloved. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground and were overcome by fear. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Get up and do not be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them, Tell no one about the vision until after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. When they came to the crowd at the foot of the mountain, a man came to him, dwelt before him, knelt before him, and said, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic and suffers terribly. He often falls into the fire and often into the water. And I brought him to your disciples, but they could not cure him. Jesus answered, you faithless and perverse generation, how much longer must I be with you? How much longer must I put up with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon and it came out of him and the boy was cured instantly. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, why could we not cast it out? He said to them, because of your little faith, for truly I say, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. The second reading also comes from the Gospel of Matthew, from the 27th chapter. Um, this is the story of the crucifixion. As they went out, they came upon a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they compelled him to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink, mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they, and when they had crucified him, they divided his clothes among themselves by casting lots. Then they sat down and kept watch over him. Over his head, they put the charge against him, which read, this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two bandits were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, you who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the son of God, come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priest also, along with the scribes and elders, were mocking him, saying, He saved others, but he cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross now, and we will, be, we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now if he wants to, for he said, I am God's son. The bandits who were crucified with him also taunted him in the same way. From noon on, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And about three o'clock, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, the man is calling for Elijah. At once, one of them ran and got a sponge and filled it with sour wine, put it on a stick, and gave it to him to drink. But the other said, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. 
Then Jesus cried out with a loud voice and breathed his last. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. After his resurrection, they came out of the tombs and entered the holy city and appeared to many. Now when the centurion and those with him who were keeping watch over Jesus saw the earthquake and what took place, they were terrified and said, truly, this man was God's son. Today we are celebrating Transfiguration Sunday. This is the last Sunday before we begin the 40 days of discipline and self-denial that we call Lent. Lent is a time when we descend into a kind of spiritual valley. It's the valley that Psalm 23 describes as the valley of the shadow of death. On Ash Wednesday, next Wednesday, uh, we are all asked to remember that we are dust and that we shall return to dust. But before we begin this journey, the lectionary brings us to the mountaintop where the air is clear, not foggy, where the sun shines in glory. In this mountaintop experience, three of Jesus' disciples experience an astounding vision of Jesus. Jesus appears to them glowing with a kind of inner light, the very light of God. Jesus also engages in a conversation with the two greatest figures of the Old Testament, Moses and Elijah. They symbolize Jesus' continuity with the Old Testament revelation of God. <clears throat> now this transcendent experience may puzzle us. Was it an, a factual experience that a scientist could describe? Or did Peter, James, and John, in fact, uh, witness, in fact, what the text says? Or is this just meant to be a biblical fable to express a theological point? If you feel you can't decide for yourself, don't be alarmed. Professional theologians are differ among themselves on how to understand this experience. We may never know with what we can call scientific certainty. For myself, <coughs> I'm inclined to believe the story as it's told. I say that because I am not a believer in materialism. That philosophy that says that the material world that we see around all, this, see all around us is all of reality. This philosophy prevails in our world today, especially among scientists. Scientific materialism says that if we can't perceive something with our senses, and if we cannot measure it with scientific instruments, then it does not exist. Materialism leaves no place for the world of the spirit. The world of the spirit is all illusion. It represents nothing more than the creative output of our own physical brains. As a Christian minister, I reject this reductionist view of life and of the world. If the materialists are right, then what do we do with the reality of love? How do you use scientific instruments to detect its presence or measure it we cannot, and yet we all know and all experience that love is real. If there is more to life and, more, and to the world than our scientific instruments can detect, then the experience of Peter, James, and John on top of that mountain cannot be thrown out arbitrarily from the realm of possibility. Behind the dense wall of material existence lies, I believe, the glory of God. Now and then, that glory breaks through the bricks and gives us a sense, a glimpse of the reality that is lying deep behind all things. I like the way the English poet 
Gerard Manley Hopkins once put it in a poem. The world is charged with the glory of God. It will flame out like shining from shook foil. But enough said on that. I would like instead this morning to look at a different aspect of this story. The story begins in a valley as Jesus selects three of his disciples to climb the mountain with him. He takes them up on the mountain and the text says that it's a very high mountain. In the ancient world, mountaintops were believed to be the places where earth and heaven brush up against each other. People thought that the wall dividing the world of men from the world of the gods became not a wall of stone and bricks, but something thin as gossamer. That's one reason why the Mesopotamians built their high ziggurats as temples. At the top, human beings might come close to heaven where the gods dwelt. It's the same reason that the ancient Mesoamericans built their great pyramids in Mexico and Guatemala. On top of those great structures, they thought they came closer to the divine. And that leads me to ask the question, have you ever thought that there might be an unrecognized spiritual motive behind all the great skyscrapers that we have built in the modern world? Are we any different really from our other ancestors? It is on top of Mount Sinai that Moses receives the tables of law from God. And it's also on top of Mount Sinai that Elijah the prophet had his intimate encounter with God who comes to him in the whisper of a small voice. They too had mountaintop experiences. Those mountaintop experiences can stand in for the mountaintop experiences that we may have on our own spiritual journey. Sometimes we have experiences where we sense the very near presence of God with us. And sometimes it may simply be an experience when through a special act of care and compassion, a friend or a fellow church member brings us a word of hope or comfort that strikes home at just the right time to when we need to hear that word. Or maybe when our life seems to be falling apart, something happens that brings the broken pieces together. We feel elated. God is good, we say. Let us praise the name of the Lord. This is sometimes the experience of people who undergo a dramatic conversion. The love of God touches them deeply. They experience respond with joy and excitement. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Once I was lost, but I've been found. Once I was blind, but now I see. They are on top of the mountain, and what joy is theirs. But notice in our gospel story, Jesus does not leave his disciples on the mountaintop. He brings them back down into the valley. And what do they encounter there? The father of the epileptic son crying out to Jesus to have mercy on his tormented child. In our spiritual journey as Christians, we have occasional mountaintop experiences, but we never stay there. The rhythms of the Christian life will inevitably bring us back down into the valley of our lives where we encounter the many pathologies and injuries of our lives that need to be healed. We may have experienced an inspiring worship service on a Sunday morning. The music may have made our spirits soar and the preacher lighted up the scripture text for us. We experience a closeness and a love with our fellow worshipers. But then we walk out the doors and back into our own daily lives 
with all the problems that surround us, the sense of letdown can be very strong. But we were never meant to stay on the mountaintop. We are meant to bring the healing power of those mountaintop experiences back into our broken lives and into the broken lives of those around us. I've discovered from my own personal experience that a strange thing can happen to us when we start to get serious about our spiritual life. We may begin, for example, a serious discipline of prayer or meditation or Bible reading, the kind of thing that we're going to be encouraged to do during Lent. And as we start this life of, dis this life of discipline, we begin to experience a time of peace and relaxation. Then something happens without warning. Troubling thoughts or dreams or emotions begin to arise. What's wrong, we ask ourselves. I thought prayer was going to lead me into, God's, into Christ's peace. What I've discovered is that when we get serious about our religion, we open our hearts and our lives to God's healing spirit. And after a time of a kind of spiritual honeymoon, the spirit begins to dig up the unresolved problems of our unconscious lives. They may be painful emotions that result from abuse or emotional injury when we were children. They may be sins that we have indulged in in secret. And they may be anger that has never turned into forgiveness. We've pushed all these painful dimensions of our lives down into the unconscious and there tried to bury them. But there they reside like demons in a dungeon, just waiting to break out and cause havoc. The Holy Spirit may break open the prison gates of our unconscious and let these demons emerge again. Why? So that the painful experiences that we have buried can be healed and our life can be made whole. Freedom begins by leading us through times of flaming fire and raging water. We expected inner peace as a new Christian, but that inner peace can never be lasting until we are healed of the demons that create turmoil in our own lives. So the Spirit ensures that we are not allowed to continue to bury the demons. Instead, he makes sure that we confront them, work with them, and bring them to healing. That is, if we are wise enough to recognize what the Spirit is up to in these experiences of turmoil. That's why a truly spiritual life can sometimes be a tumultuous experience. Over and over again, we find ourselves climbing the mountaintop to experience a divine consolation, only to be led again into the valley, there to apply the power and the insight we encountered on the mountaintop to the persistent problems of our lives. There's one last thing I would like to pull out of our readings today. You may have noticed that I followed the reading of the Transfiguration story with a portion of the Crucifixion story. I did so because there are striking parallels between the two stories. The Transfiguration takes place on the mountaintop. The Crucifixion takes place on the top of a hill named Golgotha. In the Transfiguration, Jesus' garments turn dazzling white. In the crucifixion, he is stripped of his garments and they are divided, divided among others. In the transfiguration, a light descends upon the disciples. In the crucifixion, storm clouds envelop the watching crowds. 
In the transfiguration, the voice of God proclaims Jesus as his beloved son. In the crucifixion, when Jesus dies, the centurion declares, truly this man was God's son. In detail after detail, the, cru the crucifixion becomes the negative image of the transfiguration. Yet in each case, Jesus remains the same, the beloved Son of God, the one in whom God is well pleased. In both experiences, God is present and at work. In one case, God is present in the bright light of clarity. In the other, God is present in the darkness of confusion and obscurity. In both cases, God has Jesus and the whole world in his loving hands. There's a re lesson here for all of us from, from this. When the cloud vanishes on the mountaintop along with Moses and Elijah, Jesus remains. He reaches out and touches his panicked disciples who are so bewildered by this experience. And he says to them, get up and do not be afraid. Get up and do not be afraid. That is the one word that we all need to hear over and over again in our lives and in our spiritual journeys, no matter how tumultuous they may be. We hear it at the beginning of Matthew's gospel, as the angel says to Joseph, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. It is the word that the angel speaks to the frightened women at the end of Matthew's gospel, when they arrive at the empty tomb and find Jesus' body gone. Do not be afraid, the angel says. He is not here, for he has been raised. We need to hear that word over and over again in our own lives as we may go from the valley to the mountaintop and back down to the valley again. And on the authority of the gospel, I say to you and to me this day, do not be afraid. Thanks be to God. Amen.